Asheville, North Carolina. Um, I do have a picture book out called Yoga Edge of Anything is my debut YA. It just came out on March 24th of 2020. Oh my gosh, that's so crazy. It feels like forever ago and not at the same time. Um, so anyway, uh, a little bit about the book. Uh, the Edge of Anything tells the dual narrative of two teenage young women, Len and Sage. Um, Len is an outcast teen photographer who believes she's slowly losing her mind. And Sage is a popular volleyball star with um, a devastating secret. And the story is the unexpected friendship that saves them both. My name is Lori Morrison, um, and I've been able to come to the past couple of Nerd Camp New Jersey's, which I've really enjoyed. Um, I live in Philadelphia, but I grew up in New Jersey, and I taught middle school English for 10 years and now write mostly upper middle grade fiction. So my first book uh, was co-written with my friend Cordelia Jensen, and that's Every Shiny Thing, which has a hardcover and a paperback. And then my, um, my last book, up for air is my sporty book um which is a, it's the story of a 13 year old swimming star named annabelle who struggles in school no matter how hard she tries but she's an outstanding swimmer um so good in fact that she is invited to join the high school team during the summer before eighth grade and that's thrilling for her because she suddenly has these older friends and gets a lot of attention from a flirtatious older boy. But while she can keep up with her older teammates in the pool, um, socially and emotionally, she sometimes ends up in over her head. Hi, my name is Sanjani Patel. I think it's my turn. <laughs> <laughs> um, I am an Austinite. I grew up in Texas, um, and I write YA as well as women's fiction. I tend to write stories with strong Indian uh, females in the center. Uh, sometimes it's cultural, sometimes it's not. Um, my YA is called uh, The Knockout, <laughs> and it's about um, a high school senior. Her name is Karina Tucker. And she's, you know, just your average high school senior. She's struggling with bullies and body shaming and first love and family dynamics. But she also happens to be an exceptional Muay Thai fighter. And she gets um, invited into the Muay Thai Open, which in the book can possibly lead to the Olympics. And with her, she's kind of disconnected from the Indian culture and the Indian community and feels that being a female fighter is kind of looked down upon, you know, there's some shaming from boys and there's this whole stigma around female fighters. So she has to overcome her insecurities and kind of connect with the female athletes that, that are in her school and around her and kind of really uh, bonds over that. And so that book, The Knockout, will be releasing in early 2021. <laughs> Hi, uh, my name is Kit Rosewater and I'm a middle grade author. I'm just so excited to be a part of this conversation today. Um, I'm the author of a series actually called The Derby Daredevils. Um, it's a illustrated series about a junior roller derby team and it's illustrated by Sophie Escabase. Um, the, this is a rotating protagonist series, which is really, really fun. So book one, which is my debut, uh, is called Kenzie Kickstarts a Team, and it follows Kenzie. It uh, came out the same uh, debut day as uh, uh, Nora's YA, so March 24th. Uh, book two follows Shelly and is titled Shelly Struggles to Shine, and it comes out this September. And book three uh, is from Tomoko's perspective and is called Tomoko Takes the Lead, and that's coming out in the spring of 2021. Um, and book one, um, this book, basically is kind of the start of the team. So it's uh, really about uh, Kenzie and her best friend, Shelly, who love roller derby. They want to play roller derby, but it turns out that they, in order to be on the same team together, they have to form a whole team ahead of tryouts. And it's interesting how with each kind of person they add on to the group, their own best friendship kind of gets strained and pulled apart. So there's just a lot of fun growing pains and friendship troubles alongside of all the action on the derby track. 
Awesome. Thank you, everybody. I realized in my introduction, which I may not have actually recorded, <laughs> that I forgot to introduce myself. I'm Emily Meixner. Um, I'm not a middle grade or children's or YA author, but I am a college professor and I teach courses on children's literature at the um, College of New Jersey in Ewing, New Jersey, and I am moderating this panel because I am one of the new um, Nerd Camp New Jersey organizers. And so I am so excited to be here with all four of you. So the first question for the panel is about why you think kids are interested and engaged and um, in books about sports particularly. So why do these books resonate with teen and middle grade readers so much, do you think? I'll start uh, with just the answer. Uh, well, my answer for that. Um, well, first, I also wanted to jump in because I said almost nothing about myself. I just went right into this series. Uh, when I think about why sports resonate with kids specifically, I think a lot about my time as a middle school teacher. I taught sixth grade and eighth grade middle school for a while. I didn't teach sports. I actually taught theater in English, so I was a little bit of a nerdy teacher. Um, but when I think about the reason why sports appeal so much to, at least when I think of like myself when I was a kid, is I think that kids and teenagers they want agency, they want to kind of see themselves actually like doing things, you know, and not just being and hanging out. And, and sports are this really, really great way uh, to find senses of accomplishment, of teamwork, of togetherness, of this goal uh, that's outside of school, that's outside of a lot of kind of adult expectations put on kids. And so I think that in this really weird way, it's kind of this, very everyday chance to kind of feel like a little bit like a superhero or just someone who can kind of go beyond like the normal like day-to-day -day kid title or teen title and a little like take on a little bit of an alter ego uh, whenever they get on the court or the track or the pool or the ring or wherever it is that they like really shine. Yeah, and I'll add on to that and just say that I think, you know, sports are such an integral part of so many um, kids' lives, middle graders, teenagers, and yet when we look at books um, that are about those, those kids, there are particularly books that are about female characters. There are not very many books that feature female sports athletes or female athletes, right? And um, by the way, I did not show my book and this is my book, The Edge of Anything. Mm -hmm. I did not do a very good job of introducing. Um, but anything, so, and so I know like one of the reasons that I wrote the character Sage, who is this volleyball star, is that I played volleyball and it was a huge part of my identity like from you know probably from the time I was 10 until like 25 like it was a crucial part of my identity but I had like all these other things I like to do too but when I was reading stories and looking for books I never found stories about a female athlete you know or about specifically about volleyball but like I wanted I love to read and I love to do these other things, but I definitely didn't find stories about like a reader who was also playing sports. And it just, you know, kids are so multidimensional. And sometimes I think books focus on, because writers love books and we're very bookish. And, you know, so sometimes we're writing about characters that are just like, just that aspect of ourself, you know, but we all, so many of us, you know, love sports like love to be physically active and kids do too and like Kit was saying like the whole like the team dynamics like there's so much metaphor of life in, in sports I think like you can really you know really get to to some crucial issues in in books that incorporate sport yeah I totally agree um I think as you both said just so many so many of of us love sports and um, I think also and I think that um, it's fun to read about characters who have passion and who have agency and sports give are pretty accessible and easy to understand and visualize and relate to um, because 
you know, you, the stakes are pretty clear. Like there's winners, there's losers. You kind of know, um, you've got built in stakes. You've often got time at, at play. Um, so there, there's a lot that, that can feel dramatic. Um, and as Kit said, just kids have agency. They're the ones doing the action. And there's an audience, which adds to stakes um, and, and, and just also relates to, I think, a lot of kids. I know when I was in middle school and high school, I felt really visible even when I probably, when probably nobody was really paying attention to me. I felt like people were paying attention to me and I felt self-conscious. And so I think there's something sort of heightened about sports when kids are on a playing field or um, in a pool or, or um, in a rink or wherever, and people really are watching. Um, and then of course, all the interpersonal aspects of having to work together um, and sometimes being pitted against other people. So I think there's just a lot there. Um, and, uh, and yeah, there, there, I mean, with up for air has now been out just about a year. Um, and, and it's amazing, like how many I, I was an athlete, sports were really important to me, soccer was my main sport. Um, but so I wasn't a, a big swimmer the way my character Annabelle is, but, but um, being part of a team um, w was really important to me. And um, like Nora said, it was, it was hard to find books about female athletes who were, who were athletes and all sorts of other things too. And it's been fun to, I feel like a lot of kids um, that I've heard from about Up For Air like the reason they picked it up was because it was about a swimmer and, and they were a swimmer and they hadn't seen that many books that were also about swimmers. So it's sort of a point of, um, of access, I think, for kids a lot. And then there's just so much that's universal and that feels high stakes and easy to get behind. Like just the way all of us, you know, watch the Olympics and picture ourselves doing all these sports, even if we don't play them, there's just something really dramatic and human about the whole thing. And I just wanted to add that here in Texas, football is a huge thing. We sort of start bleeding football from the second that we're in elementary school. Um, and one of the things with my character, Karina, she feels that she's the only female fighter. She's the only female athlete. But when you start to look around you, you realize that there's so many female athletes out there. You have you know, cheerleaders and dancers. You have females in the weightlifting team. Yeah, martial arts, you have things inside school and outside school. Um, so you, when you really think about it, the, you know, reaching readers because sports is just so much part of normal life. And there's a lot of things that, um, that kids and even adults will learn um, through different aspects of, of teamwork, uh, being on a team, forming a network, forming a bond that maybe you can't find anywhere else. Maybe you can't find it sitting in a classroom or after school clubs or at home or wherever else you may be socializing. And one of the things that Karina learns through Muay Thai, maybe on the surface, it just seems like fighters and violence. But one of the things that she learns is how to harness all of her anxieties and stress and really um, meditate so that she can focus all of her energy. And so, you know, sports is kind of that a real life world experience that kids can get. As all of you were talking, I was thinking about, I was reflecting back and I was, you know, I was an athlete in middle school and high school and, and through college as well. And I was trying to reflect back and think about the books that I read when I was that age. And I don't think I read very many books that had female athletes in them. Um, I certainly didn't read very many books that had female athletes who were also literary. So I thought that was a really interesting comment. And then I was thinking about like the different sports in your books. And I don't think I read, I mean, if it was an athlete, it was probably like a runner or a dancer or probably maybe like someone who rode horses. When I was growing up, horses were, horse books were big, but, but a fighter? No, absolutely not. Like, you know, thinking about um, the, um, a roller derby. No, right. So these are, I mean, this is really exciting that, you know, you can see girls in these books doing all of these different kinds of, of sports. And so um, just listening to you made me really excited to hear your books, which is where we're going to go next. So um, maybe, maybe we'll just go alphabetical. So 
Um, we'll go to Nora and then Lori and then Sajani and then Kit. And if you could just read an excerpt from your book for, for us and, um, and talk a little bit maybe about your craft and you know what you're thinking about when you're writing a sports scene. Okay, yeah, sure. Um, so yeah, this I'm gonna read like about a minute section from The Edge of Anything. Um, it's dual narrative, like I said, but Sage is the volleyball star. So this is um, from her point of view. Just one more, Sagey. Ella Cruz smacked her hip as she trotted past. Only Ella could get away with calling her Sagey. But then nobody fed her set flake Ella. Sage picked up the ball, the team's energy thrumming through her. Most of her teammates, good as they were, wouldn't trade positions with her for the world. She sensed this instinctively, the same way she intuited when a player was going to tip almost before the player did. With the game in the balance, her teammates didn't want the serve, didn't want the risk of failure. That was the difference between Sage Zendaski and the rest. These were the moments she felt most alive. Sage slapped the ball with her palm, her mouth twitching a faint smile just to mess with Asheville's players. This was why she showed up early to their three-hour practices and why she often stayed late, why she played in an off-season travel league, why she spent practically all of her free time with the volleyball in her hands. The whistle shrilled. Sage tossed the ball and crushed it. Asheville's back middle position six dug the serve perfectly. Sage had a heartbeat of indignation, Ugh, told you, Craig, while she raised a position in the back row. She sunk down as Asheville's hitter connected with the ball. Me, me, Liz Greer called, causing Sage and Nina Marto to scissor away from her. Three, Ella shouted, flipping a short set to the middle. Kayla drilled it, but position six made another perfect dig. Five times the ball exchanged sides, Asheville's hitters clearly avoiding Sage. Come on, thought Sage, one time. Short, screamed Ella as Asheville's middle flicked the ball over the blockers. Hannah Wainwright dove backward, managing to pump it up with her fist, but the ball rocketed toward the back wall. Asheville's bench erupted as Sage took off. The ball was nearly a body length in front of her, but high, and she just might. The wall, she sprawled instinctively, hurling her fist upward. It connected, sending the ball sailing back to the court. Okay, so that's just a little snippet from um, the opening um, volleyball scene from in Sage's first chapter. And I guess um, when I, what I really like to do um, with sports scenes, I mean, really with, with any parts of the book is I want the reader to feel like, like they are there, like in the moment. And so when I am writing a scene, I it's it's almost like I am like I inhabit the moment completely like my body like I'll be writing in a, in a coffee shop and like my body will like jerk or I'll be like you know like punching things out because I'm almost like you know I'm reliving like the experience like I've like when I'm talking about like sprawling or something or squatting down you know like the burn in my muscles like I I can feel that and like I want the reader to be able to feel that and like one of the most gratifying things like I had a reader reach out to me um last week and she was like oh my gosh like I I hate sports like I don't even like sports and I like loved this volleyball but like I was like so wanting her to win you know and like that was so gratifying to me because um I I want people that don't know anything about volleyball to get as obsessed with it as Sage is to feel why it's important because it is important like it's important to kids it's important to the people that play it but like like and it has those built-in stakes, but you have to make those stakes come across for the reader. And so figuring out a way to like kind of gradually build a crescendo um, is something that I really focus on when I'm writing the sports scenes. I love that. And I love that opening to your book, Nora. Thank you. Um, so I will read... Up for Air starts um, with Annabelle taking her last final exam of seventh grade, and then, which does not go so well. Um, and then chapter two it is Annabelle at the pool. So she goes from school to the pool and just shows her there in her element. So I will read a little bit from that scene. Annabelle changed into her new black racing suit and lowered herself into an open lap lane between two grown-ups. One of them was swimming a smooth, quick freestyle, and the other bobbed up and down in a slow breaststroke. She pushed off the wall and started to swim, 
feeling the familiar pinch of her goggles and watching bubbles stream ahead of her as she blew out air. Stroke, 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 stroke. Once she reached the other end, she flipped, turned, and pushed off, her strong quad muscles launching her forward. Her mind cleared, just like always, and her arms and legs took over. Each time she came up for a breath, she heard a burst of noise, people chatting, little kids shouting by the baby pool. But then her head was back under where she couldn't hear anything other than the swish, pull, and kick of her own body. By the time she reached the wall again, her muscles itched to speed up, and it felt so good to pick up her pace. This wasn't like school, where she was always aware of what everybody else was doing. Who finished tests early? Who wrote so much that they had to ask for extra paper? Who hissed a yes when a teacher handed back an assignment? In the pool, she could sense where other swimmers were without wasting any focus on them. She was only vaguely aware that the distance between her and the freestyle in the next lane stretched longer and longer as she swam faster and faster. She barely even noticed when the two other lap swimmers finished and got out. After her fingertips touched the wall at the end of her last lap, she was surprised to see an older girl standing over her clapping. Okay, and I'll stop there. Um, so I, I really relate to everything Nora was just talking about, um, about really trying to like embody those moments. Um, I know I did that with this book, although I think I wrote more of Up for Air at home in the privacy of my own home. And then um, I've been working on something brand new. Well, recently I had been working on something brand new that, that's about a softball player. And that I was writing in a coffee shop and had a very similar experience of like imagining myself squatting and diving. And I don't know what I looked like, but, um, but I think that's important. Um, with, with Up for Air, with the swimming scenes, you know, they're a little different than the volleyball scenes um, in Nora's book or the roller derby scenes. Um, and I haven't gotten to read Sajani's book yet, but um, it's a little different because a lot of the swimming moments are kind of individual. Like there's a lot with her team, but then, but then there are these moments where she's in the water on her own. Um, and so it's a different challenge, but it was really important for me to be able to use all her senses. So to think about like how everything felt and what she would see and even hear. And like, sometimes she can smell the chlorine and the greasy snack bar food when she picks up her head. And so um, I think something I really tried to do craft wise was to work in all those senses. Um, and then also to try to show as much as I could about Annabelle as a person and um, her concerns and her worries uh, as she's swimming. So, um, so it was it was a strategic thing to start this book, showing her sort of in one kind of action, taking a test and um, and struggling and and what was going through her mind and everything. And then the very next chapter, in action in the pool. So that without you know, you always hear that advice: show, don't tell. Um, and I think there really does have to be a bit of a balance because sometimes you have to tell some things, but um, I did try with the swimming scenes to use, to embody what she was doing and to use the five senses and also to just think through what can I show about her as a person as I um, show her in action in the pool? And what can I show about sort of what's going on emotionally with her? Awesome readings. <laughs> So I'm going to read a beginning um, fight <laughs> sequence, I guess, fight scene from uh, the beginning of the knockout. It's not as intense um, and emotionally driven as some of the other fight scenes, but it kind of like, I'll, and I'll talk a little bit about the crafts of it. But um, this is Karina. Uh, she's at practice right now, and this is how it goes. Uh, sweat poured in rivulets down my body like this was a fight of my life, and the aforementioned pink gloves got their licks in. My fists were up to protect my face and every muscle in nerve lit. I ducked and dodged and hit and punched. My lungs pounded out breaths and controlled grunts. Adrenaline surged through my veins. My teammates called me the girl on fire. I scorched their ring and this blonde chick had nothing on me. At least that was what I told myself during every fight. They were good, but I was better. They were tough, but I was fierce. They hit and punched hard, but I was stone. And what do stones do when they careen towards someone? Why they knock them out? and mama said, knock you out. <laughs> in this very moment, the cheering crowd muffled into bleak silence, sending a ringing through my ears. 
every face blurred into one long ambiguous slate of heaving bodies. I counted the milliseconds as everything went into slow motion. My breaths escaped hard, roaring in my chest. My skin tingled with excitement and anticipation. I bounced on the balls of my feet. My nails dug deep into the leather of my gloves. Most people didn't get this, this whole Muay Thai business. Too much violence, too much hatred. It was a sort of stuff left for boys, cause what? Boys could be boys, boys could act rough, and girls had to sit with ankles crossed in pristine dresses and keep their opinions to themselves. Society said girls shouldn't be fighting. Indian girls especially shouldn't be doing these things, yeah. But right now, whatever anyone else said or thought didn't matter. It was a sport of passion, of skill, of years and tears in the making. So that was part of the first <laughs> practice sequence. Um, some of the things that, that I tried to uh, think about, well, kind of just um, bouncing off of what Nora and Lori mentioned already, that when, you, when I'm writing fight scenes and, and really any kind of scene, I'm just like emotionally invested. And I think um, with sports scenes, there's so much energy because you're, you're thinking how are things playing out physically and you're kind of, you know, you start moving your body and, and, and Bobby and then you're like, oh man, I really want to hit the gym because <laughs> that's all I'm talking about is a Karina lifting weights and punching people. <laughs> and, and with Muay Thai, a lot of it is very cultural and meditation is a huge part of it because the sport isn't about violence. It isn't about bringing negativity with you. It's about, um, controlling your emotions and it's about uh, focusing and harnessing your anxieties and whatever angers you have. And in the book, Karina is going through a lot of things. Like I mentioned earlier, she has bullies, she has uh, trauma in school, she has a boy that she likes, but maybe the, you know, the parents don't like her and family dynamics and everything. And so Mai Tai is really a way of helping her to focus her life and getting things on track, like it's her outlet. Um, and so with um, the fight scenes, I, I tried not to make it just tell, 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 um, sort of like what Lori was mentioning earlier, um, because that would just make for a very boring <laughs> scene. You're just like, she does this and she does that. So I'm trying to incorporate some of the things that she's learned um, in Muay Thai, which is the meditation. Um, everything around her kind of slows down, almost pauses so that she can see. She has a moment of clarity. And yeah, and that's what I, I try to do. <laughs> I love that. I, I just, I, I love how different all of these scenes are and yet how that kind of craft like is that's that very similar craft is like threading through all of them. Uh, my section is going to be a little different in that it doesn't come at the beginning. Uh, one thing I neglected to say about the Derby Daredevils is that it's not just middle grade, but it's, it's younger middle grade. And I think a huge part of that with writing a sports scene was, um, that I felt like I really needed to kind of like work my way up uh, to that in the text. So, um, so I'm actually gonna read a section from a little bit later in the book. And an important thing to note is that Kenzie has a really like vivid imagination. So this is like the very first page. This is how she imagines herself um, on the track. And it's important that she doesn't really get the chance to see what it's really like until way, way later in the story. So here's her actual first experience um, playing a roller or, or going through a roller derby jam. All right. Pack ready, Mambo said. The eight girls in front crouched low. Kenzie took a deep breath. This was it, her first real derby game. Pack, go! The blocker scrambled into motion. Kenzie balled her fists and closed her eyes. Whenever she imagined playing derby, she always saw hundreds of faces in the crowd. She could read the words on the signs as they waved. She could hear her name being chanted. But in real life, being on the derby track was way different. Even if there had been a huge crowd, Kenzie never would have heard or saw them. Instead, all Kenzie could hear was her heart thumping in her chest and her breath as it raced in and out of her mouth. All she could see was a flurry of wheels on the track. Jammers, go! Kenzie's eyes shot open. She pumped her arms and kicked her skates out to the side. Don't fall, she told herself. Don't fall, don't fall, don't fall. Kenzie and the other jammers zoomed forward. In just a few strides, the other girls slid in front. Kenzie could only see the backs of her skates as she worked to catch up to the pack. Kenzie groaned. Her worst fears were coming true. She wouldn't even score one point by the time the scrimmage was over. Incoming! Shelly and Tomoko suddenly broke from the other blockers and pinned the cherry pits jammer behind them. 
The jammer swerved one way, then another, but Tomoko and Shelly would not let her through. Kenzie watched as a gap opened between two other girls. Go, go, Tomoko yelled. Kenzie put her head down and barreled forward. She caught up to the pack and slipped between the cherry pits blockers. Lead, Mambo called as Kenzie broke out in front. A jolt of energy ran through Kenzie's veins. She was the lead jammer. She could end the jam right now before the other team had time to score. Or maybe she could earn some points herself. And I'll stop there. Um, in terms of the craft behind sports scenes in general, I think that, you know, Sajani and Lori and Nora have said some, I mean, basically the process that I go through as well in terms of putting yourself in the moment. Um, and Lori really uh, took one of uh, the key things I tried to keep in mind when she talked about the five senses or, or multiple senses um, being used to describe a scene, I was really nervous about writing sports scenes, especially because roller derby is not a, I think it's it's not so much of a, a universal sport. I mean, like like schools don't have roller derby teams. So I was nervous about how to keep the action clear and how to kind of take a moment that could be just maybe 10 seconds on the track and expand that into like pages of text. Um, because for so many other types of things that go into narrative, you know, you, you want all this action to be happening um, to fill up a chapter. And then suddenly you realize that you need to write a whole chapter about something that's going to take place in one minute. So the main craft strategies that I use to, to help stretch that moment so we can really fully embody it is uh, to use multiple senses. I try to think of as many as I can, you know, um, whenever I'm working out or playing sports, I try to keep in mind, like, you know, when do you kind of like taste that sweat, that salty sweat, like, you know, on your upper lip and, and what are you smelling when you're on the track and, and things like that. Uh, the second thing that I try to keep in mind with craft is to look for different viewpoints of the action and try to find either the most interesting or ones that can break it up. So we're in Kinsey's head for the narrative, but at the same time, if there's something that one of the other players on the track sees, you know, I want their voice to be a part of the scene. I want to show that there's other perspectives of someone being like, hey, there's this gap in the, the derby pack to get through. Um, so I try to switch lenses, uh, you know, as much as I can. And then the third thing is I always like to use a beta reader or just a test reader. And I always try to say, read this and then just tell me what's happening. Like, you don't need to say anything about um, anything else except for what is the action at play. And that's just because above all, when we put ourselves in the moment, when we go through all the five senses or the different lenses or the internal thought, the internal thought is so important. I never want to lose sight of the what is actually happening because I feel like as soon as I do, I'll lose my reader, especially since, you know, I know I've have young middle grade readers. So those are the, the craft things I keep in mind. I have my writer's notebook here and I wish you could see it because I have taken so many notes. Um, and one of the classes that I, that I teach at the college where I work is a class on teachers for teaching writing. And I wish this was not the last week of class because I have so much stuff here that I could share with them. But um, some of the, some of the things that I wrote down were just like, just like the precision of like the, and thinking about the, the nouns and the verbs and the adjectives that you have to use that are like sort of sports contextual related. Um, and then thinking about things like pacing, right? And trying to balance like externally what's happening with the characterization that's happening internally and point of view. Yeah, I have so many notes. One of the questions that I had for you, um, and I was thinking about this is I just wonder like how much research do you have to do? I mean, how much of this comes out of, you know, just sort of familiarity with the sport and, you know, how much of this is stuff that you have to kind of look up and learn about. And maybe, you know, this will be like our shift to the, to the last, you know, question, which is like prompts and tips for kids, you know, is one of the things that they need to do, like, do they need to do some research about this? Can they kind of write about sports that they don't necessarily know about or um you know how do you feel about that and then you know what other tips and prompts do you have for kids who want to write about sports 
Um, I think it's definitely easiest to start with a sport that you have some familiarity with, even if you don't play it, um, you know, maybe you watch it on TV all the time or you're interested or you're like, have a passion about it. You love a player or something, you know? And, um, but I certainly, I mean, I, played volleyball intensely for many years and still had to the 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 in in that sport and I think in as in most like the rules are constantly changing um even like some things like what names are called like what what you know terminology so like when I played you know uh, you know now it's like I what I actually did was um gave parts of my book to a a teenage volleyball player now, you know, to make sure that it, that it was resonating. Um, and I think that, I don't think you should ever be afraid to write about anything, you know, like that you are really passionate. Like if you're not like super, like maybe a kid doesn't play a sport because they're not sure, like if they'll be good enough or something. And maybe writing is a way that could actually get them into that sport, you know, like maybe, just just the fact of of writing what the experience would be like might be a way to gain to build that confidence and so i would i would never say like no you haven't played this sport you can't write about it you know like um but i do think that i i love what people have said about using the senses um i love a number of people talked about the meditative aspects of sports i know like Sajni specifically, that sport, you know, meditation is part of it. But Lori, when you were reading your, from your book, you know, she's like, that's, you can tell that she's, you know, that's a meditative time for her. And like in, in my book there, Sage actually explicitly says like, this is her meditation. Like her mom wants her to do meditation, but she doesn't understand like volleyball is her meditation. And um, so I think what I kind of trying to to flip and, and talk a little bit about how can you use sports scenes to get it like emotional depth of characters. Like one suggestion that I have is, you know, okay. I always say pretend you're the character. Cause that's just like how I write, like, I, you know, embody your character. But like, if you imagine that your character is practicing your sport and then add on to that, that your character is furious about something. Okay. So then how does that impact the way the character performs? Like the way the character thinks about drills, how the character is interacting with their teammates, what they're noticing, what, um, you know, are the lights too bright? Like, are they, are they like irritated by everything? You know, what's going on? Like kind of write that a little bit and then write the same scene with a different emotion, like your character coming into it with a di very different emotion. Like maybe, um, maybe they just flirted with their crush outside, you know, or um, maybe they lost something precious to them or they were humiliated in class. And then kind of compare those two scenes and see like what can change depending on the mood of the character and how, how the sports language and even how you can manipulate it, kind of like what drill they're doing to reflect what where they are in their emotional arc i love that and i i can go next because um i i had some ideas for prompts that sort of uh are sort of echo some things that you just suggested nora in in a different way um so first for research so i like i said i Sports were really important to me, but soccer and softball were my big sports, and swimming wasn't. And Annabelle in Up for Air actually started off as a secondary character in a completely different book. Um, and in that book, she was a swimmer because that other character um, was not a great swimmer. And it, it was she, her identity as a swimmer kind of was like. Uh, part of when she was a secondary character that was just pushing the buttons of someone else, of a different main character who had always liked swimming and then tried out for a team and realized that she, she thought she was a good swimmer, but she was just, she just had fun in the pool. Um, so Annabelle had started out as a swimmer because of that. And when I decided to, to write her story, I tried to make her a soccer player instead. Um, because that was my sport that I felt like, oh, I won't have to do any research if I'm, you know, I really know if it's soccer and it just didn't work. And I don't know why, um, but she just, 
it, it didn't work unless she was a swimmer. Even though I knew a lot more about soccer than swimming, the scenes didn't have the same energy. And I think some of it is because a big part of Up For Air is, um, has to do with Annabelle's body being developed and different attention. Like, it's very much about um, some of the different social and emotional stuff that goes along with puberty and the attention she's getting for her, her body. And I think somehow that really worked in the pool. And some of it was that it, it um, worked better as this calming thing for her when she was kind of alone and, um, and having that meditative feel that, that you brought up, Nora. But yeah, so I tried to switch it so that I wouldn't have to do so much research and it didn't work. Um, so I did have to, I had to look up a lot of rules and, and I was teaching middle school at the time. So I did watch a lot of my students swim meets, which helped a lot. And um, I had a critique partner whose son was a competitive swimmer and she gave some helpful feedback. And then I had two of my students who were especially competitive swimmers read the book um, to, to give me feedback on the swimming stuff. And they were able to like give me some things about like, just language stuff that that's like yeah that's technically what it's called but like you wouldn't it wouldn't really you wouldn't really say that that kind of thing so um so that was helpful and i yeah i do think it it would have been a harder it would have been hard to write about swimming if i had never gone swimming before you know and um because it it was helpful to have that sense memory but i think that that it shouldn't be if that's what the, if that's the story you want to tell or that's the story you feel like you need to tell for whatever reason i think um you can go out and have an experience maybe that's harder right now than at other times but you can go out and have a lot of experiences or watch um all sorts of things now um so and and there and get feedback from other people who can give you a lot of information so i think um i, I think that any, you know, if, if, especially if there's a sport that you love to watch, even if you don't really play, there's really nothing keeping you from, from writing that kind of story. Um, and I, and in terms of tips or prompts, um, the scene that I read you from Upper Air is a scene where Annabelle is really on, where she feels like really in control and in her element in the pool. But there are certainly other scenes in the book when things are all going wrong. Um, you know, when she's not having a good day in the pool and she's doubting herself and things are going wrong. So I think um, that it can be, I think it, it could be a good starting point, especially if, if a kid is missing a sport right now and maybe is wanting to think about it and write about it. A good way in might be to start by writing a scene in which they're really on, like having a really good day and everything. And maybe it's a real, so, you know, maybe they're writing from memory about something that really happened, or maybe it's fictional, but either way, um, to first write about a moment where you just felt on and in control and at your best, um, and try to use those five sen senses and embody the moment. And, you know, like Kit was saying, stretch out those, those key moments so that they expand on the page and get more page space than they actually, than time they actually took up. Um, and then, maybe flip that and then write another scene uh, about a day when everything's when when the character or you are just having an off day um at the sport and just things are going wrong and um can't quite get any you know things just aren't really going your way and in both cases i always like to think about what can you show about this person through as we see them in action what can we understand what can you get in there that where that helps us see who is this person? What do they care about? How do they see the world? Um, so I will tell you that I was an MMA, <laughs> not quite my <laughs> side. Um, and I was definitely afraid of getting punched in the face. Um, so there's a lot to writing something that you don't personally know, but there is a lot of emotion and depth that you can add to writing something that you do know. Um, like how it feels to be in an arena at the open and having all these people watch you and you might be getting your butt kicked <laughs> you might not and you know what's going on in your head and, and the the jitters and the nerves and what is your body feeling and what is training like and what exactly are you doing for training what is your diet like how is your body changing one of the things that karina faces in the book is um 
she's body shamed because she's super toned in some areas, but she's also really bony. And so she's kind of like that skin muscular <laughs> girl, if that makes sense. Um, so you, you're also trying to, to envision the story and the character and the environment, everything as a whole. Um, so there was a lot of research that went into Muay Thai, especially because it is something that's cultural. Um, and when you're writing something that's outside of your culture, um, you definitely want to make sure that you hit all the right spots. You don't want to offend anyone. You don't want to get anything wrong. And then with the Mai Tai Open, uh, the US Open, there's a rule book that's like 33 pages long. So, <laughs> you know, having to go through all the rules and making sure that Karina actually would, would qualify <laughs> in real life. Um, so yeah, so there's, there's always, um, there's always a research to everything, um, or for me anyway, always a lot of research, even if it's something that I'm familiar with, something that I do every day, I just want to double check and make sure that I have everything correctly. And another thing in the knockout is that uh, Karina qualifies for um, the Olympic tryouts. And so in reality, you know, Muay Thai is not actually in the Olympics, but in the book it is. So, you know, there's that differentiation. And right as I was editing um, the last stages, which is proof pages for the book, they changed some terms in the in the U.S. Open. So it's like, okay, we got we got this right in time. <laughs> you know, hurry up and go back. <laughs> Someone caught that and make all the um, the adjustments. Um, one of the things that I would recommend. Oh, and of course, I just want to touch what uh, Nora and Lori mentioned that always have beta readers. You always want to have readers for your, anything that you write for all your books and preferably someone who's been in that experience. I had um, a fellow fighter read the book and bring out some concepts and some you know additional things that I could add. And that was that's always helpful because whoever is reading your book is always going to find something that you missed. Um, it's inevitable. It's always going to happen. And you, you become really appreciative of those things. Um, a prompt that I would say is um, kind of getting inside your character's head as you're writing a scene, um, putting them like completely immerse yourself in that character, in that scene, whatever's happening. And in a therapeutic way, think about what they're feeling, their emotions, how they're handling things, how they're reacting to things. And I think, you can do that any day because every day you're gonna, you might feel something a little bit different. So that's why I feel like it's therapeutic to kind of see how you would react or your character would react based on how you're personally feeling. Um, right now, maybe during COVID and shelter in place, you feel kind of frustrated and maybe you don't have a lot of control over anything right now. So you can really bring that out in the character scene and use that as a prompt. I love that advice about kind of getting fully into a character's head and especially using the sports scene as like an outlet for like emotions that they're feeling either about the sport or sometimes especially like this like combination of emotions about different aspects of their lives. Um, in terms of research for uh, the Derby Daredevils. When I first got the idea to write the series, I knew a lot about roller derby, but was just an aficionado. Like just, um, I had moved to Austin, Texas, I think like a year, year and a half before. And uh, there was roller derby um, where I had moved from previously, but roller derby was huge in Austin and I became obsessed with it, just totally obsessed. Um, but when I decided to write about it, not that, not that a writer needs to do this, but for me, I had wanted to immerse myself as fully as possible. But I also know, and, uh, you know, for other people, and I think that for myself, everyone's experience with a sport is a valid one. So to explore a sport, I, th I think is really helpful, but you don't necessarily need to be a rock star and and totally excel in that sport. And so for me, uh, my journey was that I uh, started uh, training to see if I could maybe do um, roller derby. And I decided a few months in, um, no, I'm not going to play roller derby. Instead, I trained as an official referee. And that was really, really helpful because uh, Sajani talked about the rules. And that really ended up being most helpful for my experience as a writer anyway. But I did, I, you know, I made this pivot and at first I felt like a total faker. I was just like, I can't even play roller derby. So why would I write about it? Or why would I, why should I get to write about it? Um, but really being an official was the right role for me. 
Uh, I loved learning all of the rules. I still got to attend practices and bouts and stuff. And um, I got pregnant right before the official bout season started. So uh, I didn't get to uh, ref in bouts, but by the time, you know, by, by the time I was really rolling with the series, I knew all the rules in and out. And I think that that is really important for any sport that you're interested in writing about, um, getting to know the rules, maybe a little bit of the history, some of the dynamics of it. That's, I think, all good to have kind of before you start. And then, of course, the beta readers are so important once you have something on the page that you're working with. Um, and the rules can change a lot. I, um, I'm i like registered with the Women's Flat Track Roller Derby Association. And so I'll get emails when they have changes to the rules. And sometimes I freak out like, oh, no, you know, has, has this already gone off to the printers at this point? But also because it's for young middle grade, a lot of the rule changes are very, very specific, like kind of complicated things you're not necessarily going to see, um, like with penalties and things like that. Um, so that's, that's kind of my advice in terms of if, if, you, if you're coming fresh to a sport that you want to write about, but you haven't yet played, um, is just to kind of do your research and have fun with it, but also I think there's lots of ways to be an expert in it. I think that you can kind of stink at something, but if you if you love it and if you have experience in it, you're just as qualified to write about it as if you're good at it. <laughs> um, for craft, you know, I said the things earlier about the the five senses and and the different perspectives. I think a really fun exercise uh, for any young writers who want to write about a sport. Uh, would be maybe to pick a scene, to pick a sports scene that you would want to write about and try your hand at writing it through maybe three different perspectives. So um, if it's a team sport, maybe you can take on uh, multiple members of the team and kind of write about the same type of action to kind of figure out which is like, like the kind of like the juiciest perspective, which is giving you uh, the best idea of the overall action going on. Um, or maybe it could be something where like if it's a race, you can write from the perspective of someone who's in the race versus someone who's like watching. Um, and I think that that's just really fun to do with sports. It, it kind of reminds me of playing with like first person and third person perspective, except for in this case, you kind of get to like actually jump around in the scene and it's almost like stepping into a picture and seeing like, what's your, what's your most dynamic uh, composition in front of you and then kind of going with that. So that's something I played with when I was drafting the first book and something I still do now with the subsequent books is when I get to a derby scene I'm really excited about, sometimes I wanna kind of take a step back and figure out which angle is going to give me the best overall uh, kind of uh, emotion that I want the scene to convey. This is such good advice. There are so many ideas here that are so exciting. So, I mean, just some of the ones that I wrote down, use, you know, use all your senses, try scenes with different emotions and try scenes from different characters perspectives and try scenes, um, you know, when a character is at his or her or their best or worst. And I love that idea because sometimes I think, you know, like kid writers will write the scene and they think it's done, but you're saying no, you know, try the scene out in so many different ways because you just don't know like how it's going to necessarily fit into the longer narrative. And then there's lots of ways to do research, right? Know the rules, go to a game, be observant, watch, draw on your own experience and all of those things are valid. And I also love the idea, um, that you can draw on the emotions that you're feeling right now, even if they're not necessarily related to sports, you, you know, whatever you're feeling right now, try and you know, pump that into a scene and that everybody experiences sports differently. So those were just some of the notes that, that I took out of all of the, all of the wonderful things that all of you said. Um, so I guess we're, we're drawing to a close here. Thank you so much for being a part of this panel and for sharing your books and sharing your experience with all of the Nerd Camp New Jersey folks who are going to take a look at this and everybody else who might potentially watch it. Um, any last, you know, pieces of advice or suggestions or, or thoughts? My, my appreciation to all four of you and I can't wait. I can't wait to read your books.
Thank you so much for having us. This was so great. I love talking to all of you. Like it was so great. And um, yeah, I, and somebody had said, you know, just have fun with it, right? Like if you're going to mm -hmm. try a new sport or you're going to write about a sport, like that should, you should always like remember, you know, why you're doing it to have fun. Yeah. Just try. Well, thanks everybody. Um, and happy, happy May. Um, I'll, turn the recording off and, and thanks to all of the folks from NerdCamp New Jersey who are supporting this and who are a part of this and who will, who will watch this. So 